Hi, this is uh, Martin Patella for Life Enthusiast Podcast with me, Spencer Feldman. This is our part two deep dive into microbiome. This will get technical, so if those of you who have complex problems or need to explain something to your doctor because your doctor has not gone to school to learn about microbiome, unless he's or she's very active on reading the thousands of studies that have been coming through. Microbiome is the most studied aspect of human body aspects of late. Anyway, here's Spencer Feldman. Let's dive in. Hey, Martin. All right, let's get to part two. Yep. So, you know, in part one, we talked about what the microbiome was, how we lost it, uh, how we gain it back again, some tricks of the trade of what you can do to uh, get a good microbiome, the main of which is uh, just feeding it properly. So now let's talk more about some of the things uh, that go into a deeper dive. First off, microbiomes are everywhere in the body. It was previously thought that there were five primary microbiomes, the gut, mouth, skin, vagina, and sinuses, with the gut being the largest comprising 90% of the bacteria in the body. We now know there's a microbiome in the liver, the gallbladder, the brain, the lungs, and I'm confident that in time we'll find a microbiome in every organ of the body. And when these microbiomes are fed with a variety of different oligosaccharides and are healthy, they protect the organs they live in from infections as well as participate in regulating their function. However, when we don't feed our microbiome, then there are only three outcomes, dormancy, death, and phenotype drift for the bacteria and the microbiome. So let's talk about these. Another name for dormancy is hibernation and bacterial cells that hibernate are called persister cells. When bacteria run out of oligosaccharides to eat, they can simply go to sleep. And as soon as the oligosaccharides return, they wake up again. This is a great strategy for the microbiome. After all, even successful hunter gatherers don't always get food. Uh, they might be injured or get sick or have bad weather or just bad luck for a few days. The issue is if we don't supply our microbiome with an adaptive with supply of oligosaccharides for more than a short time, the dormancy process can cause problems. When, dormant, uh, when bacteria go dormant, they trigger the release of compounds, uh, polyphosphates and bradykinin, which increase membrane permeability and lead to a leaky gut and leaky blood-brain barrier. And uh, we're gonna get more about into those two, but one thing to know is the same process that causes a leaky gut also causes the blood-brain barrier to leak. The second result of a lack of oligosaccharides is that bacteria can just die. Not all bacteria are good at going dormant, and even, that those, even those that can hibernate have to wake up eventually, and if there's still not enough food for them, they, they can just die. And then the third outcome is phenotype drift. That means they evolve to different forms. A healthy microbiome has a wide variety of species, but very little, different, uh, very little variety in phenotypes. The bacteria are all happy and well-fed and don't need to change much. On the other hand, a lack of oligosaccharides and the presence of parasites can trigger phenotype drift, turning good bacteria pathological. A sick microbiome loses species one by one, and those that survive adapt to the low oligosaccharide environment by finding a new food source. This can be undigested food that spills over into the large intestine, or, it can, or they can just translocate into the body and start eating us. So let's look at the spillover in more, more detail. We talked a little bit about it in the beginning, uh, in part one. The only things meant to enter the large intestine are oligosaccharides and fiber. But if we eat more protein, fats, and carbohydrates than we can digest and absorb, they spill into the large intestine. And we mentioned how this could happen due to lack of proper chewing, low stomach acid, low bile secretion, low pancreatic secretion. Could also happen if the small intestine just can't absorb as much as you're giving to it. Um, another way this can happen is if a person has a great digestive system, but they just overeat and take in more than anyone could digest at one time. Uh, another way this can happen is if the small intestine is damaged, like we said, and just can't absorb the food. Regardless of how it happens, proteins, fats, and digestion, uh, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates in the large intestine are a problem. Now, if fat and protein get to the large intestine, clostridia, a common gut bacteria, through phenotype drift, which we mentioned earlier, can turn into a form that turns proteins into the toxic diamines putrescine, putrescine and cadaverine, which is found in bad breath, putrefying corpses, and certain other conditions human can get, humans can get. 
If fats and proteins get into the large intestine, clostridia, a common gut bacteria, can, through phenotype drift, turn pathological and turn proteins into the toxic diamines putrescine and cadaverine found in bad breath, putrefying corpses, and some other conditions. They also create ammonia and toxic short chain fatty acids like valerate, isovalerate, and isobutyrate. Clostridia can also turn fat into ruterin, which is a broad spectrum antibiotic like Cipro, acrolin, which is a highly reactive genotoxin and mutagen, and trimethylamine, which causes arterial plaque. And if carbohydrates get into the large intestines, you can get an overgrowth of candida, excessive hydrogen gas formation that can lead to methane production. And we'll get to that in a minute because it's an important issue. So these are one example of the dangers of phenotype drift. If there are enough oligosaccharides in the diet, then even if you have the occasional spillover into the large intestine from a feast, the bacteria won't have the pathways to putrefy it because normal clostridia doesn't putrefy. It's only when we've starved these good bacteria and they're phenotypically shifted to pathological forms that you start having the issues. If however, you don't have enough oligosaccharides in your diet for a long enough time, and you have chronic spillover into the large intestine, then the phenotype drift will occur and the clostridia will learn how to putrefy undigest undigested food. This putrefying form of clostridia is also responsible for tetanus, gangrene, necrotic hepatitis, and pseudomembranous colitis, among other things. A but second issue is- You know, what's interesting is that, for example, children with autism mm -hmm. have uh, been known to have clostridium difficile overgrowth. Mm -hmm. And uh, tests showed that as long as they were kept on, on, the, on an antibiotic, the antibiotic was blocking the clostridium and they were more normal or having a better outcome. But the moment the antibiotic was discontinued, the clostridium returned to the, um, I don't know what, overgrowth and uh, the symptoms return. Yeah, yeah, Seriously. absolutely. And autism is a huge part. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, a second issue with spillover and phenotype drift is that it teaches our bacteria to eat us as well. So, Having bacteria in large intestine eat fiber and oligosaccharides is not a threat to us. We're not made of fiber or oligosaccharides. We're not plants. On the other hand, if you have protein spillover and cultivate bacteria that eat protein in the large intestine, well, your internal organs and muscles are made of protein. If you have fat spillover and cultivate bacteria that eat fat in the large intestine, well, the brain and nerves and all the cell membranes are made of fat. And if you have carbohydrate spillover, well, you cultivate carbohydrate, um, carbohydrate bacteria in the large intestine and the joints and cartilage, uh, the cartilage in your joints are made of carbohydrates. So part of a healthy microbiome is making sure you don't have spillover into the large intestine you know, by working in our digestion and not eating to excess because you don't want to teach them to eat your own tissue. All right, let's take a look at some dietary hacks. Okay. Let's take a look at some diets that people are trying now with this new understanding that we have. A carnivore diet, someone who just eats meat, is someone who can't digest or absorb carbohydrates. When they try, they get spillover into the large intestines and they just feel terrible. But they can digest protein really well. Um, like the carnivore, someone who's doing keto and feels well on keto also probably doesn't digest carbohydrates well, but they can digest fat pretty well. And the vegetarian or vegan is probably someone that doesn't digest protein well at all. And when they try, they get spillover of protein at large intestines, but they can digest carbohydrates just fine. And the person that feels great on a low fat diet, well, they're not digesting fat well. People gravitate to these diets because they lack the pancreatic enzymes to properly digest certain foods. Now it's good that people are able to avoid foods they don't digest well, but it's not a long-term solution. If they never address the underlying issue of pancreatic deficiency and spilling and dysbiosis. One, they're going to develop long-term deficiencies of the foods they're not eating. And two, the enzymes the pancreas should be creating not only digest proteins, carbohydrates, and fats in the intestine, but these same, these same enzymes are then reabsorbed back into the bloodstream to digest rogue proteins, fats, and carbohydrates from normal wear and tear of metabolism. Without enough of these enzymes, the waste material accumulates and causes all sorts of problems. Specifically regarding the carnivore diet, I would offer a few points. One, carnivore animals eat the intestines of the animals they kill, and in the intestines, they're finding the digesting plant matter. So even carnivore animals are eating plants. 
two, the Hadza of Tanzania, the best studied hunter gatherers, only had successful hunts about every third day. Their stable food was still tubers. Uh, you know, while being a carnivore may be fine long term, we just don't know because we don't have any uh, any human studies or any uh, groups of people that have done it. And third, since a carnivore diet is only going to uh, contain meat oligosaccharides, the microbiome is going to be of limited genetic diversity. And I want the most genetically diverse microbiome possible. So what, what I would say to the carnivores is, fantastic. You found that you don't digest carbohydrates well, and you found that you can survive on meat. You went from a bad microbiome to a good, very limited microbiome. Let's upgrade you to the, to the full, complete complement. Let's get you all the way to a good omnivore microbiome and you'll get healthier still. Uh, I yeah. promise we talk a little bit about methane and flatulence. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, when, okay, so the gut is always making hydrogen. Um, if you have a lot of carbohydrates hitting the large intestine, you can end up with an excess amount of hydrogen. Now, in a healthy microbiome, hydrogen and carbon dioxide are being formed naturally, and they turn into acetate, which is a valuable short-chain fatty acid. Also, hydrogen being the smallest element is able to directly cross an intact gut mucosa and go into the bloodstream, where it's an antioxidant in the mitochondria, I believe, can use it. In a sick microbiome with carbohydrate spillover, excess of hydrogen can turn into methane. Uh, protein spillover can create cadaverine, pustrocine, scatol, indole, and hydrogen sulfide and other decomposition and putrefaction end products that give the hydrogen methane the bad smell. And it also, like we said, uh, slows transit time by uh, paralyzing the intestinal muscles. So what we really want is for any excess hydrogen, first off, we don't want to make excess hydrogen, so we want to avoid uh, fermenting in the large intestine. But we want any excess hydrogen we do make to go down the acetate pathway, not the hydrogen sulfide or the methane production pathway. So how do we do this? There's three bacteria that are involved in this competition for what to do with hydrogen. You've got the methanogenic archaea. Okay, they're not actually a bacteria, but close enough. That would be the methanobrevibacter smithy, uh, and that makes methane. And then you've got the sulfate-reducing bacteria to sulfibrio, which makes hydrogen and sulfate. Um, and then you've got the acetogenic bacteria, Blautia hydrenotrophica, which makes acetate. Now, the ones that make methane, methanogens, these are extremophiles. They were among the first life forms on the planet living by underwater, underwater volcanic vents. And they do really well in extreme conditions where nothing else can survive. These are like the weeds of, of the gut, right? They'll grow in really terrible conditions, but they're very easily outcompeted as long as there's enough food source for more advanced bacteria to take over. So as long as there's enough sulfate in the diet, methanogens won't be able to compete. And sulfate is created by, uh, from exposure to the sun, from, um, from sulfur elements get to the skin, which turns the sulfide to sulfates. And it's also in the primitive diet. Um, sulfate is also reduced by certain toxic uh, elements, gly glyphosate in particular. Uh, now, while I do put chondroitin sulfate in the Panacean product, personally, I take an eighth of a teaspoon of magnesium sulfate food grade in water six times a day. So I'm getting both magnesium and the sulfate. And like I said, if you've got enough sulfate in there, you're going to shunt away from the, uh, the methane production, and that is only going to leave you with uh, acetate and some hydrogen sulfide. Uh, a little bit of hydrogen sulfide is not a big deal. Actually, you need it. Uh, it actually plays a lot of roles in wound repair. Um, yes, it's one of the compounds that give flatulence bad, its bad smell, and too much is not only embarrassing, but can also cause cell damage, leaky gut and Parkinson's. But like I said, you need a certain amount. Um, it inhibits phenotype drift in the gut mucosa. It stops translocation of bacteria into the body. It's a fuel source of mitochondria. It participates in tissue healing. It stabilizes arterial plaque. It's a general anti-inflammatory. So the point is you want to have some of it, just not too much. And so the key to not having too much hydrogen sulfide is the microbiome needs to be properly regulated. There, the microbiome will only create the right amount of hydrogen sulfide as, if as a whole, it's in a healthy state. So what's the answer to this? Take care of your microbiome with oligosaccharides and, and, and other techniques, and you will downregulate 
your hydrogen sulfide production if it's in excess to the right amounts. Okay. Sure. You know, there are people selling machines, gadgets that will produce hydrogen gas, mm. right? And having success with pushing hydrogen gas, saying, well, this is a most rejuvenating thing you can offer your body. Mm -hmm. So here you are saying, well, except excess hydrogen gas is troublesome. Well, except hydrogen, excess hydrogen sulfide. Um, excess hydrogen alone is, uh, if it's in your gut, it's just going to give you flatulence. Yep. Um, but the hydrogen sulfide is, is definitely a problem if it gets too high. And if you have methane producing gut bacteria and not enough sulfate, that hydrogen will turn to methane and the methane's a problem. Yeah. But breathing in hydrogen is, you know, I, I was breathing in hydrogen from uh, gas tanks uh, before they even had machines for this. I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a fan of it. Um, I now have the machines that make it. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a useful uh, thing. It's, it's, I find it uh, calming a little bit. Um, I don't think breathing it's going to cause the, the issue uh, because the issue with excess hydrogen production is more a side effect of a, of a microbiome that's out of whack. All right. I wanted to address that. Sure. And the other interesting thing is I've run into a lot of people who are unable to eat onion, garlic, mm. um, sulfur containing veg veggies, right? Even the, the, the rest of the cruciferous are pretty problematic for a bunch of people. Mm. Do you have thoughts on that? Well, I haven't studied it, but my guess is it's a combination of one, not properly digesting it down. And then two, not having the right mix of bacteria to take all the parts that are broken down and turn them into their proper end products hmm. and having it get caught halfway. And this happens a lot. And we'll, we'll address this when we get to short chain fatty acid production, mm -hmm. because if you have, you know, one bacteria will eat one uh, oligosaccharide and then create something else, which gets eaten, which creates something else, which gets eaten and yeah. so forth down the line. And if you can't go all the way through, you end up with these partial metabolites that wreak havoc in the body and we'll get there. Yeah. But the next thing I want to talk about is something called zonulin, which is starting to make the rounds in the alternative medical communities. Mm -hmm. Zonulin is one of the primary molecules that control how tight membranes are. Intestines, blood brain barrier, arteries, veins, capillaries, lymphatic vessels, the membranes of all our internal organs, and of course our skin. Now in a healthy person, when there's a toxin in the gut, right? You eat something that's gone bad, you know, a bad oyster, the intestines release zonulin to get rid of the toxin by flushing water into the gut, creating diarrhea. And then you get those peristaltic waves, right? And there's a peristaltic wave that starts midway in the small intestine and goes down and that's diarrhea. And there's another one that goes midway and goes up and that's the vomiting reflex. Um, now, this is meant as a temporary strategy and it works great. You'll get flushed out of the toxin. The problem is chronic elevated zonulin levels, not enough to create diarrhea, but enough to cause all the membranes in the body to leak. And it backfires because the exhausted intestinal cells can no longer maintain a positive water pressure and toxins and bacteria get into the bloodstream. This is diarrhea in reverse. It's not we're flushing junk from our guts out of our body. We're flushing junk from our guts into our body. Leaky uh, gut. Leaky gut. So uh, ele elevated levels of zonulin cause the membranes to leak, which leads to the translocation of bacteria, viruses, and undigested proteins and endotoxins and pyrogens into the tissues of the body. Zonulin basically makes fecal matter leak out of the gut and turns the body into one big toilet. Uh, one example of this is osteoarthritis, where patients have beta proteobacteria from their guts in their joints, right? And for the geneticists out there, zonulin is coded on chromosome 16, which as you know, is the chromosome associated with all the diseases that humans have that other primates don't in large numbers, the cancers and autoimmune disorders and, and nervous system diseases. So it's, it's on chromosome 16, which should tell you something. So do I hear you say, if you have osteoarthritis, you very likely have a leaky gut? I would say yes. There may be other ways it gets in there, but you know, if we're finding this bacteria from the gut in the joints and people with osteoarthritis, I think that's a smoking gun right there. Right. And so then uh, saying, if you want to get better, you need to take care of the intestinal terrain. Well, what you'd need to do is you'd need to uh, 
get the zonulin to come back to normal levels. So you're not continually flooding the large uh, the joints with beta proteobacteria. And then if you have a good uh, microbiome, the immune system should be able to go in and clear that out for you. All right. And do we go straight right back to the um, panaceum? Or? Yeah, well, the, the, the main key to, a, to your microbiome is we, got, we have to feed it. The oligosaccharides, right? Yeah, yeah. There's no way around that, you know? Yeah. Okay, so we talked about how zonulin creates diarrhea. And then we talked about how it can go in reverse. So um, the intestines have a flushing mechanism, which is an extreme as diarrhea. The brain has a similar version. It also flushes itself clean with higher cerebral spinal pressures and uh, fluid pressures and pushing the fluids in and out um, and pushing it through the blood brain barrier. So in creating what's in essence a brain flush, chronic elevated zonulant, however, can deplete the brain's reserves and results in toxins backing into the brain rather than pushing out. So by the same process by which the gut leaks and gets into the tissue, the brain barrier, the blood brain barrier can leak and you can get fluid, you know, toxic fluids into the brain. I, you could call it a reverse brain flush or brain diarrhea if you want to be gross. I believe how that every- about, How about uh, just breach of the blood brain barrier? Yeah, and you know, how would you expect, uh, you know, the common way of understanding that's brain fog. You know, hey, I just can't think well today. I'm like, well, why? Well, you know, you've got toxins going in the brain. My guess is that every organ has a cyclic flushing mechanism uh, all the way down to the cells, um, which we haven't discovered yet. Uh, and that basically the process by which we are meant to flush our organs and ourselves out when you have excess zonulin reverses and toxins go in. So again, it's important to keep the zonulin down. We'll talk about that. Another compound made in the gut that can cause havoc outside of the gut is called a lipopolysaccharide or LPS for short. It's a component of the membrane of gram negative bacteria. And it's one of the most inflammatory substances known to man. So if you have lipopolysaccharides in the blood or tissues of the body, the body thinks it has a bad bacterial infection and launches an inflammatory response. And what happens is um, if you have an overgrowth of the bacteroides class of bacteria, and this is what happens as we age, we end up with more and more bacteroides and less firmicutes and more and more lipopolysaccharides, we end up with uh, lipopolysaccharides passing through the leaky gut, courtesy of zonulin, into the bloodstream, and it creates a chronic inflammatory response. So let's talk about what that can do. Chronic lipopolysaccharides will lower glutathione, which means a person can't detox properly, and lower cytochrome P450, which is what allow, would allow the glutathione to actually attach the toxin. So that's lowering phase one and phase two detox. Um, so actually that might be something you could use our Xenoplex product with since it will sim it can support both cytochrome P450 and glutathione at the same time. Um, lipopolysaccharides will increase autistic behavior, right? As you mentioned autism before. Vaccines actually contain lipopolysaccharides and adjuvants, making the person hypersensitive to lipopolysaccharides. Uh, lipopolysaccharides damage the oligodendrite cells, which protect nerves, cause low blood sugar or hypoglycemia damage horm uh, thyroid hormones and receptors, damages the kidneys, the mitochondria, the liver. If you've got a client with high liver enzymes and can't figure out what it is, look up their, take, see if you can test for the lipopolysaccharide levels. It'll alter mineral levels. So it'll raise copper up and bring zinc down, which is also a mineral uh, pattern you see in autism. Yes. Right, so chronic lipopolysaccharide exposure is very damaging. And since we're only expecting, you know, the body's only expecting to get this uh, a little bit, you know, every once in a while from an infection. Uh, it can also make stool uh, alkaline by impairing ammonia detox, and uh, it synergistically makes uh, mercury toxicity worse. So, you know, it's leaving the immune system on constant alert, which is making huge amounts of free radicals to kill the infections, uses up the antioxidants, and eventually the person gets an, immune, uh, an exhausted immune function. And then all the other tasks, such as maintenance repair, that the body doesn't have the energy to do since it's constantly dealing with what it thinks is a life-threatening infection. Um, okay, so how do you know if you've got a pathobiome, right? Most people who have bad microbiomes driving their illnesses don't present with gut issues as their primary complaint. So the first is brain is emotions, brain and emotions. Um, remember, the microbiome is responsible for regulating and producing neurotransmitters and hormones, including serotonin, oxytocin, cortisol, adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine, and GABA, either directly or by making things almost identical to the ones 
that we use like those that work just as well. Now, if you transplant the microbiome of a courageous mouse into a timid mouse, the timid mouse becomes courageous. So many of the personalities we think we have are really the personality traits of a microbiome. Uh, another interesting study showed that if you gave uh, women probiotics, they became less reactive to angry or, or upset faces. So if you have someone who is a people pleaser, a personality that can't say no, it's probably a sick microbiome is what you're seeing. And then again, brain fog is another indication because the same compounds that cause leaky gut cause the blood brain barrier to leak. Mm -hmm. Another prime indication that someone's got a microbiome that's out of whack is fatigue. The polyphosphates, and, uh, which are the compounds created by bacteria to prepare to enter into a state of hibernation, also can cause a mito mitochondria to hibernate. Uh, mitochondria can pick them up and go dormant. It also causes the mitochondria to leak via activation of their mitochondrial permeability transition pores. So it can really do a number on your mitochondria. And by the way, check your food labels. Somebody at one point in time thought it was a great idea to approve the use of polyphosphates for use in the food supply of stabilizers and thickeners. Uh, also- Could you uh, define better polyphosphate? Yeah, it's, it's one of these things that the bacteria in the, mito, uh, in the microbiome will use when they are going into, and hibernating. So sure. you've got the microbiome, it's saying, gosh, there's really no oligosaccharides here. I'm gonna just take a nap for a month or a day or a week, however long. It yeah. makes polyphosphates as part of that process. So we have. So you're actually turning your bacteria into dormant. Yeah, when you when you eat polyphosphates, you're not only shut, you're not only making your uh, microbiome bacteria go dormant, but also possibly your mitochondria. Terrible idea. Uh, the Who way I understand it? it, phosphate is what PO4. Uh, I believe it is. Polyphosphates right? so are. That would be like polyphosphate would be. There, those those compounds are a bit more complex. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, polyphosphates are an issue. Um, and then excessive propionic acid can lead to fatigue by sequestering carnitine, which slows the Krebs cycle, uh, for those that want to get kind of deep into that. Yeah. Another indication that someone's got a uh, pathobiome, which is another term for sick microbiome, is chronic pain. This is because uh, the lipopolysaccharides, uh, they induce inflammation, but they also increase substance P, which is the very compound that creates the sense state that is responsible for pain sensation. So a leaky gut makes everything hurt more. And then, all right. So what about parasites and cancer? You know, that, now that's interesting. Uh, when we talk about the gut, parasites are, are something that should come up, right? Endemic. Yeah. So parasites are an ancient adversary. Now are the, the mammalian uh, immune system is over 200 million years old, but parasites have been infecting and living with us and our pre-mammalian ancestors for over 500 million years. And in that immense time frame, they've learned a lot of strategies to evade, suppress, and attack our immune system. Uh, parasites, they can hide in our cells, or in the case of retroviruses inside our genome, they can manipulate the cytokine and interleukin signals to make our immune system more docile. They can kill our immune cells directly, but perhaps their greatest trick is they can vary the surface proteins on their outer coat so the immune system doesn't recognize them. Now consider T. brucei, the parasite that causes sleeping sickness. It has over 2,000 genes that code for the major protein expressed on its surface. It, like all parasites, is a master of disguise. This also explains why some complex, uh, some chronic diseases come and go in waves. What's happening is the immune system learns to recognize the parasite, knocks it down, then the parasites regroup, change the protein to one of the other 2,000 genes, and then they multiply again and the immune system can't see them because it's cloaked. And then an event, and then it takes a few more months and then it learns it again. And this back and forth, like you'll see this with Lyme clients, you know, it's just the immune system has to learn over and over and over how to recognize these things. And if the immune system isn't good at doing that, they just keep, you know, the cycle just goes on for someone's entire life. So, you know, eventually this, uh, this the person will have good days and bad days and then good months and bad months until eventually with age and exhaustion of their immune system, the parasites finally win. Well, here's a suggestion for your next project, huh? parasite cleansing. Well, but here's the thing, the, the, uh, the microbiome is the one that should be doing that. And I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Immune evasion of parasites and viruses is a very complex topic, but these bugs manipulating our immune system in various ways, such as interfering, interfering with immune cell growth, expression, signaling, 
stimulating immunosuppression signals, and in the case of certain gut parasites, suppressing digestive enzymes that would otherwise digest them, which of course causes more microbiome issues. The point is, parasites don't just attack immune cells, they manipulate them. And this is a difficult task for the immune system. Some pathogens create lipopolysaccharide coats that are almost identical to human tissue. It takes a very finely tuned immune system to see that these parasites are not self, while at the same time not overreacting and attacking the healthy tissues that they're mimicking. Cancer is another such situation. Cancer cells don't just look like human tissue, they are human tissue. Our immune system needs to be so finely tuned that they can identify and destroy cancer cells even though they're technically human without also destroying healthy tissue. Now, here's an example. Tumors create a cytokine called TGF or tumor growth factor beta. And that converts T regulatory cells into a form that ignore cancer. Tumors also downregulate MHC1, major histocompatibility complex one, just enough. Because if they did it, if they knocked it down too much, then T cells would come and kill the, the, the tumors. And if they didn't knock it down enough, natural killer cells would come and kill them. So they manipulate the immune system to these very fine windows of opportunity where the immune system can't see them. In fact, cancer behaves so much like a parasite that I'm convinced that they're caused by parasites, viruses included in that group. It had to evolve over millions of years to get this sophisticated. There's no way cancer could figure out all these tricks in one lifetime every time. So are parasites and cancer inevitable and unstoppable? Fortunately not. Parasites may be 500 million years old with a lot of tricks up their sleeve, but bacteria are 3.5 billion years old. So our microbiome has seen it all. And it is definitely up to the challenge of bacteria that bad, um, that parasites can bring to it. Now, remember our microbiome has a thousand times more genetic material than we do. And that's not even counting what the bacteriophages have. It has billions of years of learning on how to deal with parasites tucked away in its genetic code. A healthy microbiome can kill or inhibit parasites, including Toxoplasma gondii, Giardia, Cryptosporidium, Trichinella, and Babesia, both directly and indirectly. So now we've got something we can work with on Lyme. And it does this directly in the gut versus, uh, with chemicals that attacks the parasites directly or, and can remove the iron they need to survive. And it does it indirectly outside of the gut by uncloaking the hidden parasites so the immune system can see them and kill them. So you don't get into this cyclic thing where it takes months for the immune system to recognize it and then kill it. A finely tuned uh, microbiome will create a finely tuned immune system that can knock these things out faster than they can cloak themselves and shift. Now, immunologists teach us that there are two branches of the immune system, the innate and the acquired, but there is a third, it's your microbiome. There's a continuous war between parasites and the microbiome, each looking to control the immune system. If you feed the microbiome, the microbiome wins. If you don't feed the microbiome, parasites win by default. Yep, this is serious. Um, one of the aids, or not aids, supporting uh, nutrients that we mentioned is dirt, right? Mm. And I've, I've done quite a bit of studying about humic acid, fulvic acid, and how they, when added to the intake, will facilitate a healthier terrain in which the microbes do grow better or sustain better. Mm -hmm. have, have you run into that? So the issue with humic and fulvic acids, at least humic from what I can tell, is while it does increase um, bacterial growth in the gut, it also massively increases C. difficile. Uh, and then there's also one other uh, bad player that I've seen in the literature that it will increase. So if I were going to do humic and fulvic acids, I would make sure to do them with things that were also knocking down the, uh, the clostridium uh, or making sure I wasn't getting gut spillover. All right, fair warning. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about candida. Yeah. Uh, a healthy digestive tract breaks down dietary triglycerides and releases caprylic acid, which is a powerful antifungal. It's the natural way the body gets rid of candida. However, this requires that the microbiome stimulates the secretion of cholesterokinin so that the pancreas can be directed to release the enzyme lipase. If the, back, the pancreas isn't releasing lipase to digest fat, either because the pancreas is just too tired and exhausted uh, or damaged from alkali burns from bile, 
or isn't getting the proper signaling from the uh, microbiome, then you're not going to be getting caprylic acid and you're going to get uh, candida growth. So to me, candida growth is really uh, a sign that the, the fat digestion's off. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't take caprylic acid as a supplement in the beginning. What it means is eventually you want to get your gut to digest fats properly, but not too much fat, because on the other hand, if you eat too much fat, uh, then you end up pushing your bacteroides count through the roof and an alstip bacteria. So, you know, all in balance. Um, let's talk about Lyme for a minute. Yeah. My suspicion is far more people have Lyme than are sick from it. That it, like Epstein-Barr or cytomegala, a lot of people have it, but they're able to keep it in control because their immune system can deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, also Babesia, which is a common co-infection, enhances Borrelia, Lyme's ability to cloak itself. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the microbiome can uncloak both Babesia and Borrelia, so the immune system can deal with it. So uh, what I would say is if someone is dealing with Lyme, for sure, get your microbiome dialed in because it's the one that's going to have to teach your immune system how to deal with this. Yeah. Now, you mentioned autism before. Yeah. Uh, interesting thing about autism, a couple of interesting things. One is if you, one of the short chain fatty acids that is in the gut, uh, that are supposed to be in the gut is propionic acid. Um, but if you inject too much into a mouse and for 20 minutes, you get an autistic mouse, it'll do all the things that autism will create. Um, you know, all the social issues and repetitive behaviors and so forth and so on. Now you want a certain amount of propionic acid in your gut, but if you get too much, you could definitely, especially if you're oversensitized, uh, you could definitely start creating certain brain issues. And high propionic acid can be caused by the growth of uh, putrefying clostridium and methane producing disulfibrio, which we mentioned, uh, high glycemic foods, meaning too much sugar. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also a preservative found in dairy and wheat. So again, just like people putting polyphosphates in our food, which was a terrible idea, someone thought putting propionic acid in our wheat and dairy was a good idea. No, it's not. <laughs> it doesn't, don't do that. Um, all right. Let's talk about some ways to shift the microbiome. First, what do we want to shift it to? Well, there's something called the Firmicutes bacteroides ratio. Firmicutes and bacteroides are the classes of bacteria that should represent the ma major classes of bacteria in a healthy gut uh, microbiome. The Firmicutes make butyrates, which is a healthy short chain fatty acid that helps repair the gut mucosa. Um, and bacteroides will ferment fat and grains to make acidic acid, good, propionic acid, good or bad, depending if you get too much, and formic acid, which you don't want, which is actually what ants use to, in their sting. Uh, so we want some bacteroides, but we want mostly Firmicutes. And the ratios I've seen are about 10 to 1 Firmicutes bacteroides. It goes down to 0.6 to 1 in the elderly, meaning they have twice as much bacteroides as Firmicutes, and that sh shifts them into a highly inflammatory state. <clears throat> so uh, the other thing is, uh, we want to make sure that the genus shift of the, of the Firmicutes that we have uh, don't shift over to Clostridium, which happens with the elderly again. They start shifting to these bad Clostridium forms. Um, another thing that happens with the elderly is we start seeing phenotype shifts where they start going from eating oligosaccharides to putrefying. So what do we want to do? Typically, we want to raise the Firmicutes bacteria ratio back to something like 10 to 1, um, which is not everybody's going to have that. Now, fermented foods will increase firmicutes, uh, and fats and grains uh, increase bacteroides. So as we age, kind of ease off the fats and the grains and start adding in some fermented foods to kind of balance that natural loss. Um, although it may be that if you age and you're taking oligosaccharides, you don't have to worry about it at all. Now, of course, too many firmicutes can also cause a problem because you'll find that in people with obesity. So like, again, everything in balance. Um, I don't norm, I don't recommend most commercially made fermented foods and drinks because they usually are high in histamine, which like zonulin opens membranes and can exacerbate a leaky gut blood brain barrier. Instead, if you want to do fermentation, I'd do it at home and I'd use fermenting, uh, ferment, I'd use a histamine lowering bacteria like bifidobacteria infansis, longum, uh, lactobacter, uh, lactobacillus plantarum, um, as opposed to things like the histamine producing bacteria like lactobacillus casei, ruteri, and bulgaris, which are found in most yogurts, unless you happen to be low on histamine, in which case you should take those, right? All right, let's get into stool pH a little bit more. Um, 
Stool pH is controlled um, by the uh, partially by the short chain fatty acids made by the microbiome. Um, the short chain fatty acids of a healthy gut. Well, what are uh, these? Are the uh, the breakdown products of uh, of, of metabolism? are primarily going to be acetic acid, butyric acid, and propionic acid. And this will give you a pH of about 6.6, .6, which is slightly acidic, which will favor the growth of healthy bacteria. If the pH becomes either too acidic or too alkaline, then the wrong things start to grow. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO and spillover of undigested proteins into large intestine could both create ammonia, which is one of the causes of an alkaline shift of stool pH. Lack of keystone species that convert lactic acid into beneficial short chain fatty acids will cause lactic acid to build up in the large intestine or lactic acidosis and can cause a stool to become very acidic. Um, the pathological short chain fatty acids, succinic, lactic, and formic acids are also almost three times more acidic than the beneficial ones. Now let's talk about the short chain fatty acids. The bad short chain fatty acids aren't bad. It's just they're intermediaries and a healthy microbiome they're created, but then they're converted into the short chain fatty acids. So example, as an example, disulfibrio turns lactate into acetate. Um, p fasciam turns lactate into propionic acid. So the rise in bad short chain fatty acids due to progressive loss of keystone species that would otherwise turn these intermediary short chain fatty acids into good short chain fatty acids. Now these loss of species means not only don't we get the benefits of the good short chain fatty acids, but we also get the bad things associated with the bad short chain fatty acids. Uh, and other causes of short chain fatty, bad short chain fatty acids would be certain infections like Shigella will make formic acid, um, undigested lactose that'll turn into formic acid, um, internally created antibiotics. Um, other causes of bad short chain fatty acids include infections. So for instance, Shigella makes formic acid and undigested lactose can also convert formic, uh, convert, uh, into formic acid. Formic acid is also an antibiotic and suppresses butyric acid producing bacteria. Now in the pH extremes, stool can go as alkaline as 9.0 or as acidic as 4.0. But in cases like this, without a, uh, an intervention, these patients are gonna die of multiple organ system failure in a matter of days. So you're, fairly, you're, you're probably not gonna see these extremes, but you know, the farther away a client is from a, pH, a stool pH of 6.6, .6, the worse their microbiome. Uh, in fact, for every one point shift away, so from 6.6 .6 to 7.6, for instance, there's a doubling of mortality. pH is a simple and effective way to determine the health of your microbiome and catch things early. But remember, um, you can have a normal pH and you can still have a terrible microbiome. But, you know, uh, if you get just a 0 0.3 shift off, so a pH of 6.6 .6 moving to 0.6.9, that's a tripling of the of the uh, alkalinity. So it's a, it's a exponential rate. So small yeah. changes on pH are huge changes in the body. Yes. Uh, so what do you do if you have, um, if you have an alkaline stool, uh, you're probably getting ammonia production and, you know, take oligosaccharides, temporarily lower your meat consumption and, or take digestive enzymes with meat and uh, increase retrograde starch. Uh, that tends to feed the, uh, bacteria that can help with this. And, you know, you might consider adding some vinegar to your salads, you know, acetic acid is in the vinegar, uh, and that can lower the, uh, stool pH and you get a butyric acid supplement. If you have acidic stool, on the other hand, this is a loss of keystone species that leads to excessive production of lactic formic and succinic acids. And if you are not able to improve this with oligosaccharides, you are probably going to need a fecal transplant. And you'd asked about that, so let's get into fecal transplants. In some cases, oligosaccharides are not enough to restore a microbiome. In this case, or not in the speed in which the patient is willing to wait. They're, they're, they're just, they're, they're in too much uh, discomfort. They want, they just need to get better faster. In this case, a healthy fecal transplant from a healthy donor might be needed. Now there's three things that a fecal transplant can do that no supplement is currently capable of. First is bacteriophages. Just like our bacteria educate and manage us, viruses called bacteriophages manage the bacteria. In a microbiome, there's two types of bacteriophages, the lysogenic and the lytic. The lysogenic bacteriophages live peacefully inside the bacteria and benefit them by giving them new genetic code to work with. They can also stimulate the good bacteria to release um, light, uh, 
elements that can go and kill bad bacteria. The lytic phages, yeah. in a healthy microbiome, there's two types of bacteriophages, lysogenic and lytic. The lysogenic bacteriophages live peacefully inside the bacteria and benefit them by giving them new genetic codes to work with. The lytic phages also live inside the bacteria, but when they're activated, they kill the bacteria. And this is actually a benefit to the microbiome. What happens is first bacteriosins are released from the dead bacteria, which can attack any bad bacteria that are present. Two, good bacteria can be killed if their numbers are just getting too high, right? Oh, we've got too many bacterioides, not enough firmicutes. You know, the, lice, uh, the lytic phages can bring down the bacterioid level. And three, good bacteria can be killed if, some, if the microbiome decides it needs some part of that cell wall or the internal parts of the bacteria for some purpose. As an example, the DNA from the dead bacteria plays a vital role in the formation of the gut mucosa. Uh, it actually acts as some structural parts of the mucosa. So Russia has done a lot of, uh, done a great deal of uh, research with bacteriophages, but here in the West, we really don't have access to them. If you want bacteriophages here, uh, you're really gonna have to get them from another human microbiome, which is a fecal transplant. Uh, another thing is the keystone species. Our microbiome contains a lot of keystone species. These are bacteria that we might only have in a small percentage, but you absolutely have to have to be healthy. Uh, one such class would be bacterial predators like the Develvibrio bacteriovorus, if I pronounce it correctly, which actually eat bad bacteria. There's lots of keystone bacteria uh, and 99% of them are not available as supplements. So if a person has lost some keystone species and doesn't have the time to wait to try to get them from the environment, a transplant can get them to get them those uh, keystone species in a day. So when do you do a fecal transplant? You know, there's no hard and fast rules. Resistant C. difficile is one indication. I would say anytime the pH of stool goes above 8.2 or below 5.5, uh, it's at a point where the microbiome is about to collapse and it could use some help. Um, all right, so how would you do it? So you've decided you want to do a fecal transplant. So how do you do it? Simple. Um, you take the fecal transplant from a healthy donor. You put it in a Ziploc bag with some uh, water with just enough salt to make it, uh, you know, normal saline. Uh, take all the air out of it. Shake the bag to mix it up, and then uh, you take it either as a retention enema or, or, um, and you can do that also with uh, a catheter tip syringe. Uh, you want to do it as quickly as possible from getting the, the stool because. They are, uh, a lot of these keystone species uh, will be, um, they're obligate anaerobes. They'll be destroyed by oxygen. So the faster you do it, the better. Um, but here's some things to keep in mind about donors. One, they should be tested for pathogenic bacteria, parasites, and other infections. Two, the, the sex is important. Male and female microbiomes branch apart of puberty. So either you get a prepubescent donor or one from your same sex, because they have to be able to deal with the hormones that your own body is creating and male and female hormones obviously are different. Three, try to get it from someone who is a home birth, preferably never vaccinated or never taken antibiotics, breastfed with organic food. Optimally, a child between four to seven years old. Uh, the, um, and you know, it should be a child that, doesn't, that has a good disposition, that you know, smiles and is happy because you know, a, happy, a healthy microbiome makes for a happy person. The donor should be in excellent health, both physically, emotionally, and mentally. Pass stool daily that doesn't smell bad and have good clear skin. Um, and if you can, pre-dose the donor with uh, panaceum for a week just to really grow it out, you know, so they have a really robust um, uh, microbiome to give you. And then when you take the, the transplant, you should be taking probiotic, prebiotics. Heck, you should be taking it a couple of days beforehand so that it's down there in the gut um, for the transplant to eat when it gets in its new home. That being said, fecal transplants are not gonna be necessary for most of us. Um, for those the fecal, for whom fecal matter transplants are indicated but won't do them, okay, probiotics and some short chain fatty acid supplements should be considered. You have to figure out which ones you're gonna use for them based on uh, the pH of the stool, and their genetic code. Are they histamine producing or degrading? You know, which way do you want to push this transit time? Things like that. So how long will this process take? Well, the mucus layer, which is home to the microbiome is only two to 900 microns thick and replaces itself every six to 12 hours. And bacteria doubles every 20 minutes. That means bacteria could go from one to 34 billion in 12 hours. So it can change pretty quickly. Uh, in part one, I talked about a client who 
was sick for two years and was better in four days. So uh, you can get a, lot, a, a great deal of improvement very quickly. What takes more time is for the membranes of the body to seal up again, for the zonulin levels to come down. We mentioned zonulin. Um, zonulin is something that will uh, be created in a, in a sick gut. If you get your microbiome healthy, zonulin levels do come down. Um, if you need a little more help with that, uh, consider not eating um, wheat, for, wheat for a little while. But the, what takes longer is actually the membranes have to heal up, uh, the, the translocated bacteria have to be uh, unmasked and killed by the newly educating or the newly educated immune system now that the microbiome is coming online. And that can be a month, two months, three months. So what you'll see, whether you do a fecal transplant or just start taking panaceum, you should, uh, what you, you would look for would be something relatively quick, uh, you know, uh, one to three days, and then slowly over time, the long-term repair work uh, taking place as the microbiome comes back online. Now, if you're, let me tell you about the process of just um, doing um, oligosaccharides, which again, for most of us is all that's needed. There's three phases to it. Uh, there's a clearing phase, a rebuilding phase, and a maintenance phase. In the clearing phase, you want to knock down the bad bacteria and yeast that have gotten some real estate in the gut. And you can consider two products we have on our website uh, or that you can uh, get from Martin for this. That's Elagica, and I would do say three capsules three times a day, and some Zoibin, <clears throat> which is, has essential oils and some bitters in them. And you can do a quarter a teaspoon three times a day for three days. We're just trying to knock down some of the, uh, the bad bacteria yep. uh, and free up the real estate for the good bacteria to grow. Uh, elagic acid, when the elagica is a polyphenol, which like we said before, will kill bad bac uh, can kill bad bacteria, but also feed good bacteria. And the bitters and the zoibin may interfere with the quorum sensing of the bad bacteria. So they don't just go into persister mode while we're attempting to clear them out. Now in the second phase, which is the rebuilding phase, you can take a quality multi-strain probiotic powder or capsule along with a quarter of a teaspoon of the panaceum or up to a half a teaspoon in juicer water three times a day. And when you mix prebiotics and probiotics, it's called a symbiotic. Now, the prebiotics, like we said, the ones you're going to have access to are the, you know, the lactobacillus and the bifidus. These are the ones for the infant gut, not adult. But this, okay, this is all right. We're just using them as a temporary placeholder to keep the pathogenic bacteria from re recolonizing until the good bacteria can grow, and then they'll replace the, uh, the, uh, the, back, the uh, bifidus and lactobacillus. So you can do that for a week or two. And then the last phase is the maintenance phase. And you shouldn't need any probiotics at this point. Just take a quarter a teaspoon of penicillin with each meal. And, you know, the oligosaccharides, they're going to act as decoy molecules to remove the bacteria from the mucosal layer. They're going to feed the good bacteria, kill the bad bacteria, raise the short chain fatty, good short chain fatty acids, balance the pH, get the bad bacteria to die or even better, phylogenetically shift back to more useful forms. Um, any thoughts on... Uh, other fructo oligosaccharides like chicory inulin or agave well, we'll, inulin or sure, whatever. Sure. Um, not everybody can do inulin um, because it's not an oligosaccharide. It's a, it will break down into an oligosaccharide. So if you don't have the digestive capacity to break down inulin, then you're not going to be getting the uh, what is made out of the fructo oligosaccharides that compose it. Uh, so and. Again, you know, yes, you, you can absolutely go and, and take um, additional oligosaccharides, <coughs> the more the merrier. But uh, if you've got the Panaceum product, uh, this one right over here, you're going to get all the oligosaccharides you'll ever need. But yeah, heck, more the merrier. Well, to a point, okay, if you start doing too many of one oligosaccharide, you're going to throw the gut off, right? So if you say, hey, I like, I want to take a lot of extra uh, fructo oligosaccharide or galacto oligosaccharide, you can actually cause issues too. Because it's, it's, it's the, you want to give the oligosaccharides in the right ratio that it's expecting, and then let the microbiome determine for itself what the right ratio of its constituents, uh, constituent bacteria should be. If you force the issue by pounding down huge amounts of say xylo oligosaccharides, because you, uh, then you're going to end up with a massive overgrowth of bifidus, and then that's going to throw things off. So right on. more is not better. What, what's good is the right amount and the right ratio. And in a form that's already digested, not one that you're asking your body to break down to get to the oligosaccharides. Right on. Great. Well, Any, you know, 
And let me tell you, before we finish, let me tell you just some personal experiences, because, you know, it's it's one thing to hear all this and it's another to actually. I was going to say, let's talk about some practical applications, really. Go ahead. Sure. So so uh, I'm happy to share with you some personal experiences I've had. Um, I wasn't sick to begin with, so nothing tremendous happened for me, but definitely some amazing things that happened. Um, first off, uh, my vision improved. I was at the at my desk with my computer and suddenly I didn't need my normal glasses. They were just too strong for me. Um, the eyes have very a very fine microcirculation. They have very fine muscles, very fine nerves, very fine blood vessels. You know, it's not like the thigh muscle with a great big femoral artery that's getting yep. lots of blood. So when the microcirculation starts to fail in the body with age, the eyes are one of the first things to go, first mm -hmm. things to get weak. And what happened? My eyesight got better. And, you know, I was sort of like, wow, that's, that's interesting. You know, I'm able to read things now without my glasses that I couldn't read before. Mm -hmm. uh, so what that's saying is I was improving my microcirculation. Another thing that happened is I got balance for the first time in my life. This isn't something that improved. I never had it. I was a mid forceps delivery. I was coming into this world feet first, paratrooper style, and the obstetrician went into my mother and turned me around with forceps and in so doing crushed my skull. And I suspect that is why I have never had good balance, you know, um, which meant I could never dance, which was always a sadness for me. Well, anyway, um, now I have balance. I can stand on one foot and take the shoe off the other foot and not fall over. I can stand on one foot indefinitely now, something I could never do. Mm. And I can dance well now for the first time. So I'm 53 and I have got a lot of dancing to make up for because <laughs> boy, is it a lot of fun. <laughs> um, you, just, just a sidebar, would you associate vertigo with uh, the lack of balance or whatever, similar kind of pathways? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, clearly they're both inner ear. Um, I don't, for me, the improvement uh, of my balance, I think was a rewiring of my brain. Remember we talked in, in, yeah. in the first talk about how yeah. your brain is wired inside the womb of your mother. And then again, on the outside. Yeah. And I think what happened is I never got the microbiome to properly wire my brain. And for me, it came out as an inability to have a good sense of balance, which right. is amazing to me because I'm 53. So that meant I was able to repair some brain injuries from over half a century ago, which I think is very exciting because yeah, a lot of people might time. say, oh, I've got this brain injury for so long and it'll never get better. Mm. Au contraire. Yeah. Um, so another thing that happened was um, I have, um, you know, I go to a gym, uh, I have my own weights in my gym and I'm going there and I'm lifting and all of a sudden I'm like, gee, did somebody come in here and, and take some, some plates off my rack? Because, you know, uh, maybe it was one of my kids, you know, they needed, they, they took some weights off because it's a lot easier and I'm doing a lot more. And yeah. I look, I'm like, no, no, all the, all the, all the, rack, all the weights are there. And so I had gotten significantly stronger mm. and my ability to be on the, um, the exercise bike, you know, got considerably longer. I was able to push myself longer and farther than I had in a long time. Right on. Uh, so that would be mitochondria. Sure. Among other things. Yeah. Um, and then uh, something interesting. So uh, I live off grid on a farm and uh, I was walking outside and uh, barefoot and I caught my foot in the door as I was walking out. And I thought that I had torn up the skin on the top of my foot and my Achilles tendon. And I hobble back home and I'm looking at it thinking, man, I hope I don't need stitches and ready to see all the blood and no blood. And then I look at the skin, it's just red. It's not even scraped. It's not even torn. I had been noticing that as I'd been getting older, my skin was tearing easier and easier. Right, like, I, you know, you grab on some, some barbed wire. And I'm like, gosh, I, I barely grazed that. Why did my skin rip? Yep. And then I realized what all these things had in common, the skin getting stronger, the muscle strength, the endurance, the balance, the eyesight. These are all things that get worse with age. Yeah, true. I was getting younger, Martin. Yeah. And if this is what's happened in months, I wonder how young I can get, like how far back can I go? Cause we know from fecal transplant studies that if you transplant the, the microbiome of a young mouse into that of an old mouse, the old mouse becomes younger. Its hair gets dark and uh, its fur rather gets dark and shiny again and fills in. 
it gets a sex drive again, it gets muscular again. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely a rejuvenating effect from repairing your microbiome. Well, I'm looking forward to some now that you've got it finished because clearly um, I could use some young mouse microbiome. Yeah. So shall we recap the whole thing? Sure. Let's have at it. Okay. So we've covered a lot of information. This has almost been two hours, I think. It's over. So, yeah. So let's go over it all. Many microbiomes don't get off to a good start because of challenging births, poor microbiomes of the mother, and a lack of adequate breast breastfeeding. Antibiotics can then knock out keystone bacterial species with insufficient oligosaccharide intake, causing surviving beneficial bacteria to starve, go dormant, or phylogenetically drift to virulent forms, some of which will translocate through a leaky gut barrier into the internal organs. Overeating and weak digestion leads to undigested proteins, fats, and carbohydrates that enter the large intestine where they feed clostridia, which turns into a putrefying form and which then sends toxic meta metabolites into the system through the now leaking gut wall, some of which enter the brain through the leaking blood brain barrier. Insufficient fat digestion leads to insufficient caprolinic acid, which leads to candida overgrowth and a weakened microbiome. No longer able to uncloak parasites can cause parasites to bloom throughout the body. In other words, the modern diet and lifestyle feeds putrefying bacteria, starves good bacteria, and without the the oligosaccharides, instead of getting health supporting short chain fatty acids, we get toxic amines and swamp gas. Unable to properly regulate the immune system, neurotransmitters, hormones, blood sugar, and so forth, symptoms appear and the person slowly loses their health. And in the case of women of childbearing age, they also uh, have the risk of passing that dysfunctional microbiome onto their children. Working backwards out of this predicament, you begin feeding your remaining good bacteria, the oligosaccharides, you can make some dietary changes, get some exercise, and if needed, take some digestive enzymes. The remaining good bacteria grow in number, and those good bacteria that have phylogenetically drifted go back to the right form. You might get a week or two of gas as the beneficial as the bacterial makeup of your microbiome shifts through various phases, but that should pass, that should end. Spillover of undigested foods into the large intestine will stop. Clostridia should go dormant. The von the zonulin levels should drop down and the gut membrane and the blood brain barrier should return to proper health. Ammonia and lactic acid production, large intestine should stop. Short chain fatty acid production normalizes, stool pH normalizes, then finally able to properly regulate the immune system, all those chronic infections should start to get addressed. In conclusion, I would say that most chronic conditions are the side effects caused by the, lock of, the loss of a keystone species. Our microbiome is so resilient that even though we barely feed it, and it's clearly under assault from the environment from day one, it still manages to hang on for decades doing its level best to keep us healthy. Imagine how amazing your health would be if you took better care of your microbiome and just fed it the oligosaccharide it needs. The humans, we can make a new generation every 25 years, but bacteria can reproduce every 20 minutes. What takes us 10,000 years to evolve, bacteria can do in five days even faster if you consider horizontal gene transfer. This means your bacteria can shift dramatically for the good in days. You means you can get better really fast. Thank you very much. Please send me six bottles and um, we're on. This was great. Thank you very much. Um, I can just in my head summarize when you're res restoring resilience to the connective tissue, to the mucosal barriers, to just general organ performance to the mitochondria, uh, you already said it, it's the rejuvenation effect. It's a reversal of all kinds of chronic degenerative um, inflammatory symptoms. Mm. So things with itis, otis, itis on the name, including, well, I'm not supposed to mention any medical terms, but expect yourself returning to a healthier version of yourself. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's the best upgrade imaginable. Yep, because it's foundational. It's mm. so foundational that it's the foundation itself. Yeah. Yeah. All right, great. Spencer, thank you very much. This is Life Enthusiast and Remedy Link. Uh, we are at www.life-enthusiast.com. The phone number... 866-543-3388.
Call me with questions. And thank you.